The Hudson River stretches from the Adirondack Mountains to New York City. It's a much different looking river the higher you go into the mountains. We know that there are a lot of researchers in various parts of this watershed and that if you look at my screen over here you can see that uh, this is actually pieces of the Hudson watershed that were taken off of the DEC website and the DEC actually um, administers the Hudson in these three parts, the Upper Hudson, the Lower Hudson, and the Mohawk drainage. And it seems sort of balkanized that way when in fact we know that this is a whole functional watershed and it should be studied as, at least in some contexts, as a whole system. We tried to um, gather many partners from state agencies, other academic institutions. Um, there are a number of research organizations. There are a lot of nonprofits along the Hudson River that focus on different parts of it, the estuary, for example. Um, we thought that it would be a really great opportunity to bring everyone together and talk about how we could partner in terms of making education programs. Um, there are a couple of really great examples of source to sink education classes that take a week or several days to move down the Hudson and talk about different issues. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity for us to do more collaboration and ESF is in a unique position to try to bring more awareness of what's going on in the upper Hudson and how that relates to what's going on downstream. So we are looking at some of the headwaters of the Hudson and we're interested in using this type of information to provide an overall picture of how different parts of the landscape contribute to the water chemistry of the Hudson. We are using this stream to look at how changes in atmospheric deposition, changes in acid rain, changes in the climate, how this affects the stream's hydrology as well as the chemical responses of the stream. And we're also looking at the water going out of the lake so we can also look at how the lake itself affects some of these processes. And we also can link this to some biological changes in the lake as well as biological changes within the stream and associated um, terrestrial system, the trees and the soils around the stream. Arbutus Lake is a relatively productive lake. It's not a low pH lake and we've seen changes within the chemistry. We see overall improvements within the chemistry uh, over the lake associated with decreasing amounts of acid rain inputs. And so you've got New York City down here and if things are not going well up in the upper part of the watershed, New York will suffer and these cities here will suffer. We know, for example, that uh, it, back in the uh, late 1800s and the uh, uh, early part of the 20th century, that the logging, the timbering in the upper Hudson, uh, the clear cutting and so on, affected the, uh, the, um, the ability of the upper Hudson to provide water, sufficient fresh water to go down the estuary. And so cities like Poughkeepsie, which take their drinking water, uh, were, were affected by that. So we know that preserving the, uh, the forests up in the north has a tremendous effect on the freshwater supplies. The CastNet system is, is a dry deposition network and it's based upon filter packs which are collected once a week on Monday and they're sent to a, a central analytical lab. They also analyze for ozone within the CastNet system as well. When they did the comparisons of like things like here versus in Washington DC in terms of how much corrosion was occurring, there's actually more corrosion that occurs up here than in these more highly pollutant environments and it's been suggested has to do with because of the frequency of rain up here we don't have a lot of dry periods so it's because continual and on average it rains here every other day so it's very important background information not only for basic science in terms of understanding what's coming into these systems but also understanding if we're changing sources how, what, how those source changes are affecting what's happening um, in the environment as well not only can you do that you can actually calculate the change in concentration you can take the actual uh, amount of material that's coming in and you can actually do look at um, figures which show the whole United States looking at the pattern from year to year to year for all the different chemical species. The data is analyzed and then it's sent to a I think it's probably another operation that actually compiles all the data. And we're talking about how we often think of ourselves as in a place, a town, or maybe a county, a region like the Adirondacks but we don't tend to think of ourselves on a, on a water
watershed scale. And yet the Hudson River is one of the most important rivers to the founding of our country. This was uh, remarkably, even though there were really no roads to get here, people found it useful enough to come up to extract iron out of these rocks. The site that we're on is part of a, a former mine site that was active and inactive for going on 200 years. And the way that you pour is you have a central channel that comes out and then a whole bunch of side channels off of that. No, that was a sifting box. Um, so this whole, would have, this, this whole right here, this whole area would have been a bed of sand. And there's actually, um, there's a foundation corner there and a foundation corner over there of where the casting house would have stood over us. And again, whenever the, the, whenever the iron's ready to pour, bring it down the central channel and then it comes off. And what it looks like is, if you picture this, um, this might be a sow pig and then all of these little things off her would be suckling. So they're called pigs of iron. That's the origin of the pigs of iron. And this is, this is one of the iron pigs. I mean, this thing is really heavy. You just cast pigs and ship it out of here like that. Right, exactly. I mean, this is solid iron. And it's when Roosevelt was here in 1901 uh, that McKinley was assassinated uh, and he went to Buffalo. This is actually from the New York Times and um, it's from the day before they found him and it's talking about not knowing where the president is. So here we go. When the vice president receives news, he will move south as rapidly as possible to North Creek. So what's interesting about this is that the nation, the nation knows that McKinley is dying and that the vice president is going to become the president and he doesn't. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's really fascinating. Really and this is one of the few places that I know of in the United States that's actually been a ghost town twice. Mm -hmm. It was abandoned in 18, uh, 1856 and then it was abandoned again in 1963. Uh, and Seneca Ray Stoddard was here in that period and he wrote, nearly a quarter century has passed away since the busy hum of industry sounded here. But once was heard the crash of machinery and the joyous shouts of children at play, it's now the shrill bark of the fox or the whir of the startled partridge. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in place of music, it's just silent, solemn, and ghostly. It used to be trees to make charcoal and build buildings and, uh, and, and ore to extract it from a mineral resource context, and now the forest is a recreational resource. And this winds up working into the conversation about public policy. How do we decide what types of recreation happen where, who makes the decisions, who gets a voice, how are the voices equal? These are all conversations that we can really engage up here as we look at talking about the Hudson River as a, as a, in, the, in the context of broader conversations. Those partnerships, if they haven't already been started, or to maybe bring in some new people that we maybe um, would like to wrap in, both on the science side and on the social science and humanity side, because we're very interested in humans and the culture of a place like this. What's the identity of people as you move down the Hudson, and, and how are those communities similar, and how are they different? I think it was quite a successful start. Um, it was a small group uh, that actually came, but I think we had all the right components there. I think that the, the people who came had a chance to talk to each other and meet each other and see what was going on. I think we did turn on a few lights uh, in dark rooms, so that was good. And we hope to continue this next year.